Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted. Thank you. And good night. No. Um, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you all to our open house. Uh, we moved into our new offices here fairly recently this year, and uh, about 99% of it is, has been completed. The one thing that has been finished is um, the sound system in this room, hence the boom box that you can see. Um, but uh, since PJ is a member of our advisory board and has a, a great new book, we thought this would be a good way to combine the two and invite people to join with us in christening our new offices. Um, as some of you may not know, uh, PJ's book is now in the top 10 and it's been out for about a month, so it's really taken off. The, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, uh, hopefully you all got a packet of information that describes some of our programs. You're welcome to become a member of the Institute, receive our publications. We produce a journal called The Independent Review, as well as many books and, and other publications. Um, and you see this is not the normal sound system. Um, the Institute itself is a nonprofit academic research institute. It's a non politicized institute. We um, sponsor many studies of major social and economic issues. We have about 130 research fellows at different universities right now. And we publish the results as books and other publications. And the results are also debated in various kinds of topics and media programs. We don't accept any government funding, and the Institute is supported solely by support from members and from grants from foundations and businesses and individuals. Um, PJ uh, confirmed to me that he was just on City Bill King Correct with Bill Maher the other night. Um, in introducing someone like PJ, uh, there are so many really funny and crazy things happening every day in our world. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a treat to have him here to comment, even on just a few of them. Uh, for example, I don't know about you, but this season, each year, well, each year of the two years, I've wondered why is it that elections are held right after Halloween? Um, it seems like a curious thing. Let's see, witchcraft, uh, politics, extortion, I don't know. Um, even, even trick or treat, which is really a harmless form of childhood extortion, I guess. Um, the candy politicians, we have to listen to their, their rant and, and um, their promises. Um, but of course, in a far more serious vein, because if you go through the taxes of implied bureaucracy, Um, in any event, our guest of honor tonight is a very plain guy. Uh, his writings have been widely published in many magazines, uh, many of the pop magazines. His wisdom is, in fact, I would say that the wisdom of PJ's work is more extensive than the combined writings of most members of the American Economic Association and other groups. And, uh, uh, and this Indeed, it's, it's a is the topic of his new book, The Rich, which has a subtitle you may have noticed called The Treatise on Economics. Um, PJ is um, a best selling author of nine books. He's a graduate of Miami University. He uh, received his MA in English from Johns Hopkins. He, in 1975, he was national editor of the National Lampoon, where he stayed as editor in chief until 81. He considers himself to be, quote, brave, trustworthy, and a big fibber. Uh, unquote, his bad habits are drinking and smoking, and I suppose being a member of our board of advisors. And many consider him to be uh, a, a gem, a, a combination of H.L. Mencken and Lynn Bruce. As I mentioned, his articles are published in, in uh, many magazines. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce P.J. Roy. <laughs> Um, I think David had it half right about the uh, reason for the proximity of elections to Halloween. All trick, no treat. <laughs> you get your windows soaked no matter what. 
Um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk a bit about uh, my book tonight because it's kind of what's on my mind. I've been out on book tours since the uh, day after Labor Day, basically on the Bataan Death March of book tours. Uh, it was sort of living proof. It's an interesting piece of economic evidence that uh, a, a, a any given writer is, uh, uh, is cheaper and more expendable than a single page of advertising in the New York Times, which would reach essentially the same number of people. Um, anyway, I, I wrote this book. Um, I wrote this book about uh, about economics because this question had been nagging me for a, a long time, a, a very fundamental question about economics, uh, which was, why do some places prosper and thrive while others just suck? Uh, and I, I didn't know. You know, I mean, it, it, clearly it was not a matter of brains. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, there is no place dumber than Beverly Hills, and and yet the. the the, the, the residents of Beverly Hills are, are waiting in gravy, you know. Um, meanwhile, you go to Russia, where chess is a spectator sport, you know, so you know they're not stupid. Um, but they're boiling stones for soup over there. So it can't be education. This is a very prosperous country. America is the most prosperous country in the world. Our fourth graders know what a condom is, but aren't sure about nine times seven. Um, <laughs> Natural resources are not the answer. Uh, impoverished Africa has diamonds, gold, uranium, oil, you name it. Uh, 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 while prosperous Scandinavia has got nothing, and that is frozen. Um, maybe culture is the key, but wealthy regions such as the lo local shopping mall are famous for lacking culture, so that's not that. Uh, perhaps the good life secret uh, uh, lies in civilization. Uh, the Chinese had an ancient and sophisticated civilization when my relatives were hunkering naked in trees. Uh, admittedly, that was last week, but, <laughs> but they, they've been drinking. Um, in a thousand, 1000 BC, when Europeans were barely using metal to hit each other over the head, the, 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 the Zhao Dynasty Chinese were casting ornate bronze wine vessels uh, big enough to take a bath in, uh, something else no contemporary European had done. And yet today, China stinks. Um, Government does not cause affluence. I don't think I'll get many arguments out of this crowd about that. Um, citizens of totalitarian countries, for instance, have plenty of government, nothing but anything else. Uh, but unfortunately, absence of government doesn't work either. Uh, 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 because for a million years, mankind had no government whatsoever, and everybody's relatives were hungering naked in trees. Plain hard work is not the source of plenty. The poorer people are, the plainer and harder is the work that they do. Uh, we play golf. Uh, and technology uh, provides no uh, guarantee of creature comforts. The most wretched locales in the world are fully supplied with the complex and up-to-date technology in the form of weapons. Um, why are some places wealthy and other places poor? I thought about this for a long time. It finally occurred to me it might have something to do with money. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't know anything about money. Uh, I didn't know anything about money as a practical matter. Uh, uh, did I have enough money to make the mortgage payment? And I didn't know anything about money in a broad or abstract sense. And I certainly didn't know anything about economic theory. And uh, I felt that I probably wasn't alone in, in this. Um, I mean, I couldn't answer the central question of my book because I was an economic idiot. And I got to be an economic idiot by the simple and natural method of being a human. Uh, humans have trouble with economics. You may have noticed this around your house towards the end of the month. Um, and, and, but it's not just because economic circumstances sometimes cause humans to starve. Humans have uh, uh, problems with economics. Humans seem to have an innate inability to pay attention to economic principles. Now, love, death, and money. These are the, 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 the three main human concerns. Now, we're all keen students of love. We, we are fascinated by every aspect of the matter, in, in theory and in practice, uh, from, from, from precise observations of X and R rated this and that, you know, to, 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 to uh, um, all the ethereal uh, sentimentalities marketed in miles and miles of Hallmark stores. No variety of love is too trivial for exegesis or can start. Um, no aspect of love is so ridiculous that it hasn't been exhaustively reviewed by the great thinkers, the great artists, the great hosts of daytime television talk shows. Um, and as for death, I mean, the public ap appetite. For, for investigation of this subject is such that, that, that the highest rated television program in America is about an emergency room. You know, the most hard-headed and unspeculative of persons 
has his notions of eschatology, the dullest mind can reason extensively about what causes kicking the bucket. Dying sparks our intellectual curiosity. Loving sparks our intellectual curiosity. Money does not. All we care about is the thing itself, preferably in large amounts. Now, we care a very great deal about that. But, but, but here, our brain work stops. We don't seem to mind where our money comes from. Uh, in an affluent society, we don't even seem to mind where our money goes. And as for larger questions about money, we shrug our shoulders and say, I wish I had more. So wh why is it that we are earnest scholars of loving and dying, uh, but turn as vague and fidgety as a high school study hall in June when the topic is economics? I have several hypotheses. Uh, none of them, I'm afraid, are good. Um, Love and death are limited and personal. I mean, even when free love was in vogue, only a certain number of people would allow me to practice that freedom upon them. <laughs> I, I seem to remember the number was none. Um, I, I'm a, a pious man, a pious man in the, in the throes of Christian agape, uh, may love every creature uh, in the world, but he is unlikely to have to meet them all. And death, too, is, is, is limited and personal. Death is as personal as it gets. And, and as limited as it gets, death has, as we say nowadays, closure. Um, plus, the death ratio is low, only, only one to one in occurrences per person. Um, economics is, is, is unlimited, and it's impersonal. Uh, economics happens constantly, all the time. It involves multitudes of people and unaccountable goods and services. And, Economics is just too complicated. It makes our heads ache. So when anything economic goes awry, uh, we respond in our limited and personal way, uh, you know, by searching our suit coat pockets to see if there are any wadded up fives inside. Uh, and then we either pray or vote for Democrats, depending upon our personal convictions of faith. Um, or, or maybe economics is so ever-present, so pervasive in every aspect of our lives that we really don't perceive it. We fail to identify economics as a separate entity. Uh, just as we can watch a man fall, slip and fall, and almost never hear him say, God, I have gravity. And we can watch a man fall ten times and not see him become interested in how gravity works. Almost never does he arise from the eleventh tumble, saying, I went down at a rate of 32 feet per second squared, uh, the force being directly proportional to the product of the Earth's mass times my weight and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between that patch of ice on the front steps and my butt. Yeah. And so it is with us in economics. No amount of losing our jobs or our nest egg sends us to the library for a copy of John Maynard Keynes' The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. Now, this very pervasiveness of economics keeps us from getting intellectual distance on the subject. Uh, we can view death from afar for 70-odd years, and uh, although love is notorious for bubbling the brain, uh, there is matrimony to cool the passions. Um, or, um, failing that, sexual climax will work in the short term, uh, uh, unless you're a president. <laughs> but, but there is um, there is no such thing as a dollar gasm. You know, uh, money, money, money is always with us. You know, what am I going to do to take my mind off money? Go shopping? Uh, I mean, uh, drinking drugs are going to cost me. Uh, I suppose I can play with the kids. They need new shoes. Uh, constant money worries have a bad effect on on human psychology. I, I would argue that there is more unbalanced thinking about finance than there is about anything else. Uh, I mean, death and sex may be the mainstays of psychoanalysis, but but note how few shrinks ask to be paid in marriages or in murders. Um, people will do some odd things for political or religious reasons, but, but that's nothing compared to what people will do for a buck. And if you consider how people spend their dough, uh, insane hardly covers it. Um, our reactions to cash are nutty. E even when that cash is half a world away and, and, and belongs to perfect strangers, we don't ridicule people for dying, uh, or in our heart of hearts do we despise them for fooling around unless we're in a tight congressional race. But let a man get rich, especially if it happens quickly and we don't understand how he did it and we can work ourselves into fits of psychotic rage. We aren't rational and intelligent about economics because, basically because thinking about money has driven us crazy. Now, 
I, I admit, I am as much of a mooncalf about this kind of stuff as anybody. I, I had no interest in economics as a kid, uh, as kids don't. Uh, children, uh, lucky children at least, live in that ideal state postulated by Karl Marx, uh, where the rule is from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Uh, getting grounded equals being sent to a gulag, uh, an angry dad is confused with Joseph Stalin. Um, and then we wonder why so many young people are left-wingers. You know? um, <laughs> Yeah, I had no interest in, 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 in economics in college either. Uh, I belonged to that great tradition of academic bohemia, which uh, stretches uh, from the 15th century riots of Francois Villon to the fish tours of the present day. And, um, you know, for university hipsters, nothing is more pathetic. I'm sure uh, Villon mentioned this somewhere in his poetry. Nothing is more pathetic than taking business courses. Uh, my friends and I were about that. In our classes, we studied literature, anthropology, ceramics. Uh, we, we were seeking, questing, growing. Uh, uh, specifically, we were growing sideburns and leg hair, according to gender. Um, it did not occur to us that the frat pack dolts and the tridel tweeties hurrying to get the Econ 101 on time in their square fashion were the real intellectuals. We never realized that grappling with the concept of aggregate supply and demand was more challenging than writing a paper about the effects of cool jazz on the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, what the L7s were being quizzed on was not only harder to understand than, say, Margaret Mead's theories about petting in Samoa, um, it was also more important. The engine of existence is fueled by just a few things. Unglazed pottery is not among them. If the rah-rah bobs and the pin sallies had been taking love or death courses, uh, we would have been right there with them. You know? But money was a different matter. We weren't interested in money. Uh, actually, what we weren't interested in was work. And, and maybe we guessed that it would be a lot of work to BS our way out of memorizing such formulae as uh, price elasticity equals percentage change in supply divided by percentage change in price. And, of course, we were interested in money. I remember we get excited whenever we had it. Um, it's just that we were determined not to earn it. Um, we would never go in search of money. Uh, money was something that would come looking for us after we choreographed our world-shattering modern dance recital or uh, mounted our famous empty gallery show of uh, preconceptual post-objectivist paintings or, uh, or when our, our, our folk rock group, uh, Exiles of Dayton, uh, learned to play Kumbaya. Um, <laughs> And we weren't going to sell out, no matter how much money was lavished upon us. Uh, business majors, they intended to, and it was a loaded phrase in my day, they intended to make money. And they, and they were going to do this even if it involved some activity that wasn't a bit artistic, uh, such as running IBM. Now, we artsy types would have been shocked if anybody had told us, and no one had the nerve, uh, that making money was creative. And we would have been truly shocked to learn that a fundamental principle of making money, a fundamental principle of economics, that wealth is created when assets are moved from lower value to higher value uses is the root of all creativity, be it artsy, IBM, Z, whatever. To us, putting money first was crass. It was as if we'd gone to a party with dozens of wild swinging chicks and instead of drinking Matus and making subtle small talk about Jean-Paul Sartre, we had just, you know, done something like the President of the United States might do. <laughs> Except that we would have thought that was a blast. You know? uh, but go into business? Never. Never. If you don't count selling drugs, uh, uh, which, which we were all doing. Um, we knew everything about price elasticity when it came to pot, uh, not to mention aggregate supply and demand. Um, in point of fact, we hairy weirdos probably had more real ex business experience than, than any business major on campus. And one other thing, my friends and I, we all fancied ourselves to be Marxists of one kind or another. And as a philosophic recipe, Marxism is cannoli of the economical, stuffed with economics and cooked in economic sauce. And still, we were not interested in economic ideas. And to be fair, the business majors weren't either. Uh, econ was not something they took because they were fascinated by the elegant complexities of economic relationships or because mankind cannot survive without economic activity. 
took econ and forgot everything in the textbook in order to get a job from somebody who took econ and forgot everything in the textbook. Uh -huh. Now, um, I turned into a square myself, of course, as everybody who lives long enough does. Um, I got a job as a journalist, but without ever considering that journalism was a business, uh, although I would have been unpleasantly surprised to get a hug instead of a paycheck at the end of the week. Um, and I continued to ignore economic issues, even though I had a press pass to the most spectacular extravaganza of economics in this century. It was the 1970s. You know? Now, the, the Great Depression may have been more dramatic economically than, than the 1970s, but it was a one-trick pony. Everybody got poor. That was it. You know? I mean, uh, in the 70s, everything was happening. In the 70s, globalization suddenly included the other three-quarters of the globe. The places that used to make our wind-up toys were, were, were making our automobiles. Everything was being imported except oil, which had hitherto been given away free with a windshield wash and a set of highball glasses at <laughs> most brand-name gas stations. Um, then one day you couldn't buy oil for money. Uh, not that there wasn't plenty of money around in the 1970s, it just didn't happen to be worth anything. Uh, we had this previously unimaginable combination of fever inflation and hypothermia business slump. Uh, you could make more money in the 1970s by buying treasury bills than you could make by breaking into the treasury. The gold standard disappeared from the scene. Maybe it joined a cult. I don't know. Um, <laughs> international currency exchange rates were determined with moon rings. Um, the, 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 the most powerful nations in the world uh, had at their helms an amazing collection of economic minimum groups. Um, Nixon, Carter, Mao, Harold Wilson, George Pompidou, Leonid Brezhnev, and the computer and electronic media revolution was just, just beginning back then, so that bad ideas about economics were suddenly spreading around the world at neuron speed. And I dozed through it. I dozed through it. And I was covering politics, too. And even I realized that money is to the politician as the eucalyptus tree is to the koala bear. It's, it's, it's food, water, shelter, and something to crap on. You know? um, it, it wasn't until it wasn't until the 1990s, when I had been a foreign correspondent for more than 10 years, that I finally noticed economics. I noticed that in a lot of places I went, there wasn't anything you'd call an economy, and I didn't know why. Many of these countries seem to have everything uh, except food, water, shelter, and something to crap on. Um, so I decided what I would do is I would go back to the econ texts that I had uh, finessed in college, and 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 figure things out. And when I did this, my beatnik loathing returned full blown. Uh, except this time, it wasn't the business majors I despised. It was their professors, the people that had written the econ textbooks that they had had to study. Because looking into a college textbook, I mean, as an adult, it's a shock. It's a shock, and it's a vivid reminder of why we were so glad to get out of school. And the prose style is at once juvenile and impenetrable. Uh, Good Night Moon, rewritten by Henry James. <laughs> the, the professorial wit, the professorial wit is duller than the professorial dicta, and uh, the professorial dicta are, are, are dulled to nearly unbearable numbness by the need to exhibit professorial self-importance. No idea, however simple, when there's more stuff it costs less, can be expressed without rendering it into a madras sport coat of a graph and translating it into a rebus puzzle full of peculiar science and notations because otherwise the science of economics is not going to look as important to the outside world as the science of organic chemistry or particle physics or something. And then speaking of matters economical, there's the price of these things. 1495 it cost me for a 15th edition of economics by uh, Robert Singer, by Paul Singer. Um, now, that book, as its edition number indicates, has been used uh, as an econ text forever. Um, that is, since 1948, which appeared in the baby boom councils forever. Um, uh, it, now, Samuelson's economics is, is considered a fossil by, 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 by most modern economists. But that textbook has been translated into 40 some languages or so, and all the current leaders of business and industry. And, and, and most of the current leaders in government, not just here, but all around the world, that is the textbook that they were afflicted with when they were in college. So I felt, you know, I had to read this, and when I did, here was another shot. Professor Samuelson turns out to be at least as much of a goof as my friends and I in the 60s were. You know? he, Samuelson says, Marx was wrong about many things, 
But that does not diminish his stature as an important economist. <laughs> well, what would? You know? If if Marx was wrong about many things and broke the babysitter, you know. I mean, Samuelson's uh, forward to the 15th edition says, uh, uh, and I quote, in, react in the reactionary days of Senator Joseph McCarthy, my book got its share of condemnation, and I'm going, hope so. <laughs> Not all that McCarthyism just to go to waste. You know? <laughs> Economics is, I mean, it's full of passages indicating that Samuelson disagrees with various uh, reactionary ideas such as uh, freedom, you know, but this, for instance. Uh, the chapter titled Applications of Supply and Demand states, crop restrictions not only raise the price of corn and other crops, but also tend to raise farmers' total revenues and earnings. Increase your corn profit by not growing corn. Now, here is a business that I think we'd all like to get in on, uh, uh, where everybody can get really rich if we would just do more nothing. In the chapter in economics with the title of Supply and Allocation in Competitive Markets, uh, uh, Samuelson seems to be confused about the very nature of what a market is. A marketplace is some place where things get exchanged. And, and, and he says, is society satisfied with outcomes where the maximal amount of bread is produced, or will modern democracies take loaves from the wealthy and pass them out to the poor? But, well, why would rich people create, do, produce the maximal amount of bread just to have it sit around? they got to do something with that bread. Well, they... They starting a mold farm? I mean, what, what, are, are the rich people stupid? I mean, what, what is this? You know? Or is Samuelson trying to talk about charity here? If he is, let me note uh, that Jesus did not perform the miracle of the loaves and taxes. Tell us what he did. You know? We all know how modern democracies take loaves away from the wealthy. That's not so complicated. It's the slip-ups and the pass-them-out-to-the-poor department that inspire a... Uh, a study of econ. I believe me, it was not reassuring to learn that the men who run the companies where my 401k is invested have minds filled with junk from the attic of Samuelson's economics. Now, of course, there were newer textbooks in economics uh, for me to look at, and I did. And what they said was not so obviously wrong, but then again, what they said was not so obvious, period. Um, here are the first three sentences of uh, the textbook Macroeconomics by David Collender. Um, when an artist looks at the world, he sees color. When a musician looks at the world, she hears music, not the PC pronoun shift. Um, when an economist looks at the world, she sees a symphony of costs and benefits. Change the CD. <laughs> so the textbooks, the textbooks weren't good. Um, this sent me back to the original source material, the classics of economic thought. But here, I had to admit, as I was tacitly admitting 30 years ago, that I don't have the brains to be a trico. Um, Wealth of Nations, Das Kapital, the general, general theory of which I'm a jigger, they're impressive works. They look swell on my bookshelf, and they put me right to sleep. Um, then, of course, there were popular books on economics, but the really popular books were about extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, getting fabulously wealthy, or going to jail, preferably both. Uh, and I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in ordinary people doing ordinary things and getting by. And, and the less popular but more worthwhile books on economics uh, all seemed to presume that I had made it through uh, something like uh, the Samuelson textbook without blowing a fuse, and I had not. So I gave up trying to be smart about economics, and I decided if I wanted to know why some places were rich and other places were poor, I should go to those places. I would visit different economic systems, free market, socialist, and systems nobody can figure out. I'd investigate economically successful societies, the U.S., Sweden, Hong Kong, uh, economically unsuccessful societies, Albania, Cuba, Tanzania, and I'd investigate societies that hadn't decided yet whether to be successful or not, uh, such as mainland China uh, or Russia, although that was two years ago, and since then Russia seems to, to have decided. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I would just poke around, I'd look things over, and I would simply ask people, how come you're so broke? Or why are you shitting in my pocket? <laughs> anyway, that's the uh, starting point, uh, uh, sort of for, and in some ways, not only is it the starting point, in some ways it's also sort of as far as I got. I mean, that's kind of everything I know. Um, but if anybody's got questions, I'll make up some other stuff. If, 
Yes. For the uh, questions, we have a mic. If uh, all the live would be good to you. I don't think we really need it. Do you? It's small enough. Oh, record it. Okay. All right. We have a hand up. Oh, we got a hand up. You may just need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, I'll ask my question first. Okay. Um, for a long time, I have to tell you, I had you confused with Dave Barry. And I realize you're both. That's okay, actually, because I had David Thoreau mixed up with Paul Thoreau. <laughs> Paul Thoreau travels more, and he's lots madder at BS and I, Paul. And that's the way, the simple way to tell them apart. But I'm sorry. Do either of them have a cabin on, on Walden Pond? Uh, no. Oh, that's another. That's yet another thrill. That's the dead one. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave the humor to you. Um, I, I, I finally got it resolved, the difference between you guys. You're both very popular humorists. You're both of a free market type orientation. I just got my latest copy of Leslie Fairbrook's catalog, and I've got under humor satire, I've got Peter O'Rourke with a picture, and below that i got Dave Barry with a picture. I look very close at the two pictures, and the faces are identical. Well, you finally can... Will you finally admit that you and Dave Barry are the same person? <laughs> no, we're, we're not, we were we were separated at birth. And, uh, Dave Dave got the booger joke franchise, <laughs> kind of closed me out of uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, weekly newspaper column syndication business. But, uh, but we're pretty close friends. We both suffer from what is known as Dave Barry hair, which is hair that if you don't spend a lot of time fooling with and put junk in. It makes you look like Herman and the Hermits about circa about 1954. It's a terrible, tragic thing. Ken Burns has it, too. A number of people are afflicted with this. Sir? I'm not. Uh, well, <laughs> my question, you discussed the fact of uh, uh, paying farmers to not grow their wheat. Mm -hmm. You adhere to the theory that well, it's called the FICA program I think, in the U.S. Could this theory be moved ahead to pay politicians not to go to Washington, not to go to Sacramento, no new laws, no raises for themselves. Is that feasible? You might be on to something there. <laughs> you know, you might be on to something there. I, you know, because I, I was thinking, you know, there are some, basically, there are usually economic answers to any problem that you want to pose. They're not always the answers you want to hear, but there usually are economic answers. Now, we all know that price fixing, if you, price, if you fix the level of price above the, the, the natural price of a thing, then you get way too much of it. So I'm not sure we want to pay politicians uh, 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 to do anything. But if you fix the price of something below its market price, or the way they did with uh, uh, rent controls in New York City, the item about which the prices are fixed disappears. Now, we have to figure out a way to fix the price of politicians below market level. Um, there is a below zero, yes. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Mathematically, it presents certain difficulties. Uh, randomly shooting one from every uh, Congress, you know, I mean, selected by lottery, <laughs> would certainly keep um, a lot of people out of Congress. But um, <laughs> I don't know. There is an answer there in there, and I think you are on to something. Sir, yes. On the uh, subject of why some cultures make and some don't, um, have you read uh, uh, Thomas Sowell's new book, Conquest and Culture, where he describes geography as having a lot to do with that? And if you haven't read that book, talk to us about being a baby boomer. <laughs> okay. Well, let's leave the baby boomer thing. I, actually, Dave, Dave got that in the, in, the, in the when Dave and I got Dave Perry and I got divorced. He got that in the settlement. That in the baby boom and the booger jokes. He got. Um, the, uh, I haven't read Soul's book, but there are, are a number of other books that talk about that kind of thing extensively. And there's one that the author's name is eluding me here, but there's a guy who wrote about why uh, in the New World there are such rich uh, 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 and, uh, and stable countries as the United States and Canada, uh, and then a whole bunch of other countries that aren't. You know, and the tendency is to say, oh, well, there are hot blooded Latins down there, you know, and which is a bunch of crap, you know, because Costa Rica is there, you know, uh, acting pretty much like a normal Western European country. Uh, and what it is, uh, the, 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 this guy's theory was simply that there are two kinds of colonists, those that come to stay and those that come to get rich and go back and blow the money in Madrid or Paris or Rome or wherever it is, or Dublin, I guess, you know, wherever they come from. Well, America and Canada 
in Costa Rica and, and a few places elsewhere in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean were settled by people who came to stay. They couldn't go back. You know, they didn't want to go back. They were scared to go back. Uh, they would starve if they went back. Whatever the reasons, they came to stay. When people come to stay, they build institutions. Uh, they're looking at it as a place not just for them, but for their children and their grandchildren. When people come uh, with an eye that they're going to make it big in, a, in the next five or eight years, you know, and then go back and be a rich person, uh, they're not. They're not building institutions. You know, you, you, you know, they they have kids too, but they have them with the local women, and they don't leave them there. You know, so they're not really too worried about what happens to those kids. And, and so I think that has a, uh, a a major influence. As for geography itself, I don't know. I mean, you got. I mean, the the the, the lesson to all of us always is Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a basket case. In 1949, it went from like a half million person fishing village to like this swamped rock uh, uh, with no natural resources. It doesn't even have enough water. It has to import water from the mainland. And it is one of the richest, per, on per capita basis, one of the four richest societies in the world. Why is that? Well, no taxes, you know, no, no, no restrictions on trade, no restrictions on trade whatsoever, very modest taxes. Uh, no restrictions on the movement of capital, uh, a solid currency, you know, all the basic stuff that any economist would tell you that a society needs to have, Hong Kong happens to have all of those things, plus no social benefit program, so you had better be serious about working and saving and doing stuff like that. Sir? Hi, PJ. I saw something in your book about equating the, uh, when you own stock, you own an opinion. And in your attempt to try and systematize or, or put some order to, to economies here, have, have you sensed that uh, you were at a loss in part because trying to create a system for opinions was a losing battle? Impossible task. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons that, that investing, one of the reasons that, that, that economics and, and, and investing have so little to do with each other, and if you quiz people, I did, as a matter of fact, quiz a bunch of people in the stock market about what their economic point of view was. I mean, are you free marketeers? Are you Keynesians? Are you monetarists? And they didn't give a shit. You know, it was that simple. You know? Most, some of them didn't know, some knew, but didn't care. You know, what they cared about was the investing. Because you're, you're, the, the, the number of variables, while the number of variables in economics is large, we're dealing with big blocky theories, you know, so we can all sort of fudge on that, you know. But the number of variables in investing is almost infinite, and you can't fudge the theory because you know you get it right in the wallet. It's just it's much more investing is a much more com com complex thing than, 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 than certainly than macroeconomics or even really than, than microeconomics. And I had this uh, secret hope as I was writing this book that I would not only would I get write this book and I hope make some money from the book, but I'd also learn how to get really rich because you know, I learned how to rich people and stuff. And so. In last, uh, about a year ago, right now, I had dinner with Shoal Merton and Shoals and John Merriweather, three of the principals in long-term capital management. <laughs> Guys who at that time were doing very, very well. And I'm sitting uh, 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 with them, and, I'm talking, and I get sort of, I get Merton and Shoals, uh, and I buy them a drink afterwards, and I say, you know, I'm writing this book about economics, and I mean, what should I be telling my readers that they should do, I mean, what should I be telling, what should I do with my money? <laughs> so, basically, but I mean, I'll tell the readers later. Right. <laughs> and they had, they both had the same information. Uh, they both had the same, same, uh, same opinion. They, they said the same thing to me. They said, trade on asymmetrical information. I said, well, that clears that right up. You know, <laughs> go home and trade on some asymmetrical information. And they, you know, they were basically saying, trade on something that you know that other people don't know. And uh, it turns out that they didn't know anything. <laughs> they just lost $3.6 billion. One, one quick follow-up. Based on what you just said, what's your view of the term fair market value? Uh, my view of the term fair market value is what uh, somebody will pay you for the stock that you just paid too much to somebody else for. Right? <laughs> I mean, fair market value has only has a meaning in, in terms of the clock. It's all right uh, right now. Well, 
Or I can do that right here. I can do the uh, I can do the autographs right here. Yeah. For those, you know. Thank you. Um, one last point. Um, the um, open house with PJ is actually the beginning of a series of programs that we're going to be holding here. Uh, debates, lectures, seminars, and so on, and we hope that you'll join with us in the future. Thanks for coming.